Assalamualaikum and hello. In our previous classes together, we have finished topic 3, which is about lexical analysis. In lexical analysis, compiler will categorize the words from our high-level programming language into streams of tokens, namely the words and its categories. Lexical analysis are not concerned with syntax. Instead, there is the job of the second phase in compiler, syntax and semantic analysis. The input of this phase is streams of tokens. In syntax analysis, this is where input will be checked for syntax. If there is error, compiler will provide an informative message. However, if there is no error in your program, compiler will produce the structure of the program. There are two types of output, either uh, streams of atoms or syntax trees. We have discussed on atoms and syntax trees previously in topic 2. Just a bit of a recap, atom is a type of primitive operation found in most computer architectures. Atoms can be implemented using just a few machine language operations. For example, if you have an input like this, A plus B, the atom can be written as add A and B and store into T1. Meanwhile, another form of your program structure is syntax tree, where the interior nodes are the operations and the leaves are the operands. So, for example, if we have something uh, A plus B, the syntax tree would look like this. So, if you see, the interior is the operation while the leaves are the operands. If you still remember, in lexical analysis phase, compiler is also known as scanner. In the syntax analysis phase, compiler will also be known as parser. Parser capability to check syntax and produce output is called syntax directed translation. We will be expanding our knowledge on how to specify formal language. For lexical analysis, the two tools Regular expressions and finite state, finite state machines are sufficient, but syntax analysis needs a more powerful language specification tool, and it is what we call grammar. Grammar is made up of a list of rules. The, these rules are used to generate strings. Whatever strings that can be generated using these rules are said to belong in the language of the grammar. Components of grammars include terminal symbols, uh, which are lowercase letters, numbers, and special characters, non-terminal symbols, which are all capital letters with one designated as a starting non-terminal, usually capital S, and grammar can also have rewriting rules. And these rules define how our strings can be generated. How can we generate strings in a language? First, we will start with a non-terminal, specifically starting non-terminal. We will choose any rewriting rules and repeatedly apply these rules until we no longer have any non-terminal in the string. This string is said to belong in the language of the grammar. This exercise, applying rewriting rules until we get a strings of terminals, is called derivation. This is an example called Grammar 1, and Grammar 1 has four rules. Um, the terminal symbols are 0 and 1, and there is only one non-terminal, which is S. Okay, so first of all, when we want to do derivation, we need to identify what is the starting non-terminal. Pay attention here, class. How do we decide what is the starting non-terminal? 
Starting on terminal is the non-terminal of the first row. So if you see here, in grammar 1, rule 1 is S can be derived to 0 as 0. Starting on terminal is the non-terminal on the left-hand side of the derivation arrow for the first row. Therefore, for grammar 1, our starting non-terminal is S. And if you notice, for grammar 1, all four rules start with S. Therefore, we can do our derivation or we can start our derivation using any of the rules in grammar 1. Rule 1, 2, 3, 4 because all of these rules start from S. Okay, now let's look at how to do a derivation. An example of derivation in this slide is S can be derived to 0 as 0. And if you see here, this is applying rule 1. And to do derivation, we will replace the non-terminal inside the string. So in the string 0 as 0, the non-terminal is S. And S over here, inside the second string, is replaced with rule 1 again. Now we get 0, 0 as 0, 0. Because this string still has non-terminal inside of it, another derivation is being done where S over here is replaced with the second rule. The resulting string is 0, 0, 1, S, 1, 0, 0. Again, we still have a non-terminal inside of this string. Therefore, another derivation is done where S is replaced with rule 3 and the string 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0 uh, is the result of that derivation and this string no longer have any non-terminal inside of it. Therefore, we say that 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0 is one of the strings that can be generated from grammar 1. If two grammars generate exactly the same strings, we say that the two grammars are equivalent. Look at these two grammars. All the strings that are generated will be the same regardless. Therefore, grammar 1 is equivalent to grammar 2. Grammars have these notations. Capital ABC means single non-terminal while lowercase a, b, c means single terminal. Lowercase Greek alphabets, alpha, beta, gamma, they are used to denote strings made up of both terminals and non-terminals. So it is very important, especially for this part, meaning a combination of terminals and non-terminals. Grammars can be divided into four. The first one with the largest amount of strings that can be generated is called unrestricted. There is no restrictions on rewriting rules. Each rule can have both terminal and non-terminal on both sides of the derivation arrow. Next is context sensitive. While similar to unrestricted, meaning both terminal and non-terminals can be on both sides of the arrow, there is a certain identified pattern on context sensitive. It is not totally random. Okay, moving on. Inside context sensitive is context-free grammar. For context-free grammar, a rule must have a single non-terminal on the left-hand side of derivation arrow and on the right-hand side, the string can be made up of both terminal and non-terminal. Most programming languages are of context-free class. Finally, we have right linear grammar. So in right linear grammar, rule must have a single non-terminal on the left-hand side of the derivation arrow and it must start with a single terminal on the right-hand side followed by both terminal and non-terminal. So the key point here, it must start with terminal. 
right linear grammar can be used to define lexical items such as keywords or identifiers. So this is the diagram of the classes of grammars that we have discussed in the previous slide. If you see here, unrestricted is the biggest class. There's a lot of strings that falls under unrestricted. Inside unrestricted is context sensitive. Smaller than context sensitive is context free and the smallest is right linear. What this diagram basically shows is context free grammar can generate more strings compared to right linear. That's why right linear is more suitable for keywords or identifiers but they are not suitable for checking syntax. Context free grammar can also be represented in another notation called Becker's Snore Form or BNF for short. So basically, in order for us to use BNF notation, all non terminals will be enclosed in angle brackets. And then our derivation arrow or the rewrite arrow is replaced by double columns and equal sign. While if you have multiple definitions for the same non-terminal, it can be written on one line using the alternation vertical bar. So for example, if your rule is S can be derived to A as B, this is how it is written in BNF form. So non-terminal S is enclosed in angle bracket, arrow is written this way, and terminal is written in its original form, just that the non-terminal is enclosed in angle bracket. Okay, the second example here uh, shows that two rules derived from the same non-terminal S. So, in order to change it into BNF, we can use this vertical bar. This basically shows S can be derived to A, S, B or Epsilon. We've talked about doing derivation to generate strings in grammar. Now we will discuss derivation tree. It is a tree where the interior is non-terminal and the leaves are terminals. All strings that can be generated from a grammar can be represented in derivation tree form. So the example in the slide is the derivation tree for the string A A A B B B and I'm going to show how exactly we get this tree of that from that particular string. So we start with the starting on terminal and it is first derived to A S B and then um, the third rule is applied here and we get A. Going next, uh, this is the non terminal S and here the first rule is applied again a s b and here the third rule is implemented again over here is the first rule this is the third rule again here rule two is implemented where it is derived to epsilon or an empty string and finally in the remaining three non-terminals with B rule 4 is implemented so you get B B B and if you notice the tree is drawn from left to right let's discuss the concept of ambiguous grammar a grammar is said to be ambiguous when two different looking derivation trees can be constructed from the same string. The left tree here, it starts the derivation by implementing rule 2 and the right tree starts derivation by implementing rule 1. However, if you notice, for both trees, they are showing the same string or they are producing the same string var plus var times var. So if you see on the left tree, var plus var times var. And on the right tree is also var plus var times var. So if you see here, 
this is same grammar, grammar 4, same input string, but two different looking trees. Therefore, grammar 4 is an ambiguous grammar. Now, discussing derivation. There are two types of derivation, leftmost and rightmost. In leftmost derivation, non-terminal symbol at the very left of the string is always replaced first. If you see the example on the slide, you will notice that the leftmost non-terminal is replaced first. Therefore, um, if you if we are defining rightmost in rightmost derivation, the non-terminal situated on the very right is always the one being replaced first. This is an example of a problem where you are asked to determine whether a particular grammar is ambiguous or not. So if you see this grammar, what you need to do is you need to come up um, of a string of your own to prove whether this grammar is ambiguous or not. And if you see at the solution, this grammar has been proven to be ambiguous because for both trees, the string AACBC can produce two different looking trees. And for the tree on the left and the the tree over on the left here, it is implementing rule 1 first, while the tree on the right is implementing rule 2 first. So if questions like this appear in assessments, you need to determine your own string and demonstrate if the grammar is ambiguous by drawing two different looking trees for that same string.